I smile, feeling a cold chill down my spine, a, an angry feeling of violence coming from my stomach. At of course, of course, there's another complication. Of course, this stupid fucking man has to fucking come with us. But there's nothing we can do. Absolutely nothing. I smile and I just take out my phone and just text Margot. And all I say in the text, again, thinking to myself, wonderful, have a text on your phone that incriminates you, but it doesn't matter. Everything incriminates me now, other than a miracle. And in the text, I simply say, remember, Margot, when we go on that hunting trip to bring your gun, don't forget your safety lessons. It's always important on hunting trips. Margot, you receive this rather peculiar message. Which I guess you could infer as a warning. But who knows? Uh, th at this point, Doug hasn't exactly been of sound mind in the last 24 or even 48 hours. Ever since he ate that that rotting flesh, you think. Uh, that's probably where things really went over the edge for, for Doug Kennedy. He's still with us. He's still with us. Uh, I will rise from the ground from laying whatever sheeting that I have down and I will respond to the text with a very simple, I'm always prepared. Indeed. You do have a hunting rifle at the cabin. Probably quite uh, unsafe to leave it there unattended, as you have been doing whenever you and Josh haven't been using the cabin, but hell, this is America if you can't leave your guns lying around. No, that wouldn't be freedom, would it? I get the text back, I smile at the bodyguard and Steve, and I say, ha, well, you can never be too careful. Come on in! Yeah, uh, and they both climb into the back. Colin says nothing. He looks every part of the archetypal bodyguard. Uh, there's not exactly a curly earpiece. We've moved on in technology from that. But he is wearing shades, despite it being night time. And he is wearing a very tight suit that shows off how large he actually is. Uh, you would be amazed if he wasn't armed. It's easy to forget, especially given how small, how parochial Novaville actually is, that, well... When celebrities like Steve Sanderson come along, they are actually more important than your town. Probably more so than anyone in it. If he went missing, if he died, thousands, millions of people would take notice. If Novaville went up in flames, well, it would be a headline for a couple of days. Anyway, you can't linger on those kinds of things. So, uh, where are we going? Oh, we're going out somewhere, uh, well, you tell him, Kevin. You'll see. It's, uh, it's gonna be a bit of a surprise. Uh, but, but hey, I, now that I have you here in the car, Steve, I, I, I wanted to, to pick your brain. I get some ideas for the team. I still remember that game against the Eagles with the seven touchdowns. I mean, how did you manage that? And I'm really trying to engage him in football talk and, and, kind of get the time to just pass and make him not think about the weirdness of what's going on. Yeah, and he gets in as much conversation as he can. It seems he has some gaps in his memory of his time at school and uh, the various touchdowns. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's, that, that, that was a good one, you think. And then he's rubbing his head and nodding, giving rather vague, general answers. Colin just keeps staring right ahead, his eyes burning into the back of your head, Doug. I can feel it, and I'm thinking to myself, well, that's that then. We need to go for this fucker first, or he'll probably kill all of us. Wouldn't that be hilarious? We did all this just to get killed by a random stranger. Quite funny, really. So what is the plan here? Are you planning on walking him to the cabin and murdering him there? Or are you planning on murdering them both in the car and driving to the cabin? What's the uh, what's the intention here? Well, the plan is was to drive him straight to the cabin, get him in, get a beer or two out, and then do the deed. Now, of course, there's this man, so I guess we're going to have to all attack him first. And 
make sure Doug make sure Steve doesn't just run into the woods. It's funny, there's so many things that could go wrong. I'm powerless. Utterly powerless. There is no real plan. There is no control. There hasn't been this whole time. For the first time in my life, I have no control. Maybe in a way I'm calm now because of that. Fate will dictate what happens next. Either we'll succeed and we'll probably all die anyway, but maybe we'll save this town. I'm starting to no longer care about the town or the community, but maybe I can save my kids. Maybe maybe they can get out of this. <laughs> Even if I die. Maybe that's maybe that'll be okay, I guess. Or we'll just die in the process. But yeah, that's all we have. Or well, that's all that's all Doug has. Get him in the building, the house, make the move. Kevin, are you suffering from similar doubts or are you absolutely absolutely committed to this course? I have to be committed. That's all we have now. We, we've started this journey. We, we cannot turn back now. What we're doing is horrible. This poor kid. I, I, I care for him deeply. But more than him, I care for my family, for, for myself, for my friends. We have to do this. There's no other way that we'll be able to live in peace ever again if we don't fulfill this, if we don't finish this. So... Just have to take him to the cabin, and then, then we'll we'll just take care of the bodyguard, and then we'll take care of Steve. That there's more of us than there is of him, so it'll be fine. Margot will be able to take care of the bodyguard, I'm sure. He won't be expecting it. I mean, how could he? Difficult to read the bodyguard, even when checking the rearview mirror. He's pretty much dispassionate. Interested only in looking after his client. Maybe he's ex-military or ex-police, used to just sitting still and doing nothing for a long time while on a watch or a stakeout. But for the time being, he's unreadable. Uh, Steve, on the other hand, is animated as hell. He is enjoying this trip down memory lane with its gaps in memory occasionally. And... Bringing up names you had forgotten, Kevin, of uh, people that passed through the school, of teachers who have since retired, of footballers in the NFL that he's met, and coaches too. And he says to you, I, 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 I wasn't going to tell you this until tomorrow, but I guess I, guess I will now, because I didn't know I'd see you tonight. <laughs> um, I've, I've passed your name on to, uh, to people, Mr. Miller. Uh, Good people. People who uh, would value uh, a coach like you. I mean, I, I, I mean big teams. Um, and I, I don't want to sound arrogant or nothing, but I think my my word actually has some, some value. Uh, I, I think when the new season starts, you're going to, or at least just before, you, you're probably going to get some calls. Wow, Steve, that's... I, I can't even begin to, to, to thank you. That's that's amazing. Look, look. Uh, uh, when I... when I Listen, I know you might call me some pussy or soft-ass kid or whatever, but when I think back to my time in uh, Novaville, it's not all peaches and wine, you know? There's a lot of, uh... bad... Uh, but, but there's good. There's good as well. And when I think of you, Mr. Miller, and I think of, uh... When I think of some of the members of the team, when I think of what we were able to do, and how I think there was a time... You're pulling into the woods now. There was a time when I would have just given up there was a time when I would have, I guess, let the bad crush me and, I don't know, flunk every damn subject, end up working in a Walgreens. Not that there's any shame in that. But you, you pushed me. You saw something in me that no one else did, certainly none of the other teachers, and not even my own family. And I uh, and and 
gave me something to hope for. You gave me something to aim for, and... Listen, I'm not trying to give you a big head. You are pulling down the trail now. The cabin isn't far from here. All I'm trying to say is thank you, because if it wasn't for you, I'd probably be... A drunk like my dad, or a junkie like so many other kids from school, or, or on just nothing, nothing remarkable. And I don't think anyone has ever given you the the thanks you deserve. Well, not when I was in Novaville, Coach Miller. Uh, you really are, as far as I'm concerned, uh, you're a good guy. You looked after me when I really needed it and no one else would. And this is, uh, of course, heartbreaking to hear all of it. I mean, I'm happy. I'm happy, but I, I know what's going to happen. And I, I really struggle to make these things fit together. It's like I'm just trying to pretend like what's going to happen next. It's, it's not it, It's not going to happen next. And it's. I'm just trying to focus on what he's saying and, and, and these positive things that, that, that I... That I made him. <laughs> that I made the greatest quarterback in oh, in the entire country. It was I was part of that. I I made that happen. I couldn't do it for myself, but I could do it for him. And now now I'm gonna kill that. Kill him. I just keep driving. Just keep driving. Margo. You know they must be close by. Your phone goes off and it's not one of them. It's your home phone. You still have a landline. Even now, Josh likes it. But Josh doesn't use the landline. Your kids do. Because you won't let them have cell phones. There is a genuine, honest moment where I consider not answering that phone call. But on the third ring, I answer. Hi, baby. Mommy? So you recognize as Isaac. What's going on, sugar? Daddy's filled the garage with smoke. And it's getting into the house and... and Isabel, you can hear Isabel crying in the background. Isabel says Daddy's sick and not not waking up, and and I'm getting scared. And Isaac, Isaac, we were wondering, Isaac, we were wondering, Isaac, Isaac. I need you and your sister to go next door right now, okay? Is Daddy okay? Uh, Daddy's fine. Daddy's Daddy's playing with a new toy, but I need you to take your sister by the hand right now and go next door. Your son breaks down. He can tell he can tell from the tone of his mother's voice that there's something seriously wrong now. He didn't believe his sister. Isaac didn't believe Isabel. They're twins, but that doesn't mean they respect each other. But when Mum starts saying you need to get next door with that urgency, yeah. He knows there's something wrong and you can just hear him crying. Is he? You hear him calling. We need to go next door. And so they don't uh, put the phone back on the receiver. They, you hear them crying. You hear their voices receding. You can't tell for certain that they've actually gone where you've told them. You don't know. You just don't know. For all you know, they've headed into the garage to check on their dad that's a terrifying thought Margo oh you can you can hope that your children have done what you've said I mean you're their mother you know what's best you they always do what you say yeah oh god but if this is the first time that they don't um after I can no longer hear their voices, I'm going to terminate that call and just instinctively my fingers uh, dial 911 and my thumb just can't hit the button 
because if this is the resolution of Josh, then this is not something I want to interrupt, but emergency services could get there a lot sooner than I could. And I don't know if the kids are out of the house and I don't know that neighbor's number by her. Um, and there's a moment of paralysis because I don't know what to do. You see a car pulling up outside. It's not directly outside the cabin. It's within walking distance. This can only be Doug and Kevin. Do you want to be here now? Are you going to be here? Are you going to sneak out before they get here and start running? What are you doing, Margot? Can I reverse pitch that to you as a like a coolness roll or keep it together to do a decision one way or the other? Let the dice decide? If you want to let the dice decide, please make a coolness or willpower roll. I leave it to you. 13. Well, that kind of mid-table result. That does hurt. Yes, it does, because you're going to remain here. You're going to do what you need to do for your friends, for the community. But it's less that than you are paralyzed with indecision. You don't know what to do for the best. You, on one hand, have complete faith in your children to obey their mother, but on the other, you worry what would happen if you actually save Josh. Would the opportunity be taken away? Would Nikolai come back and try again? There's a lot of thoughts flooding you right now, but Kevin and Doug, you're unaware of all of this, and you're back out in the car as you pull up. So, uh, what are we doing, night hunting or something? Well, we got a few things in mind uh, there, Steve, but we thought we'd start off by just going to... This is a friend of ours' cabin, and we're just going to start off with a little drink, and, uh... Well, then we're going to talk about a little opportunity. We, we uh, Well, I mean, Colin Kevin... leans, uh, puts a hand up to you, Doug, and then puts, an, uh, puts his other hand on Steve's shoulder and whispers something to him. Steve shakes his head. Uh, Colin whispers something else. Steve sighs. Colin doesn't think this is a good idea, guys. Why not, Colin? You don't like beer? Sir, he says, looking at you. It's the middle of the night. My client here has got a busy day tomorrow. I, I'm under instructions from the Patriots to not let him drink. Okay, I guess he doesn't have to drink then. But we got some plans to discuss in the cabin. Why is that a pro- You can come too, Colin. Do you have an interest in charities? Do you- Oh, I will be coming, sir. But the issue, if you don't mind my saying, Mr. Sanderson, is business meetings should be run through your agent or manager. They should not be taking place in the middle of the night in a cabin in the woods. I am sure you can understand why, sir, he says, looking at Doug, adjusting his shades so that you can see quite clearly. Both of his eyes are pitch black. There is no white to them at all. They are two black orbs in their sockets. It's funny, on one hand, that should deeply unsettle me. No, it doesn't. Normally I would ask for some kind of coolness, but you've seen so much at this point. Oh, in fact it's almost the opposite. It's a challenge. One final challenge from hell itself, saying that I can't do it. Or maybe it's God trying to stop me, but no, I don't think so. No, no, it's one final obstacle from man, some stupid little security man who thinks he can stop me actually achieving my goals, and it fills me almost with this angry pride as I say, well, it's a good thing Steve's his own man, and people like you, uh, you know, don't tell him what to do. It's the other way around, isn't it? <laughs> okay, so I want you to make a roll now to see if you can persuade Steve to override Colin. And Colin's words of warning, which are perfectly reasonable. Could I ask you to make a charisma roll, please? I'm going to give you a modifier based on the fact Kevin is here and Steve trusts Kevin. Uh, so you can have a plus three to your ability, basically. With a plus six, that's an 18. And I think as I am saying this and I say this, Part of me realizes that the only chance I have here is 
Kevin, and I just sort of look at Kevin, and I just add, Or maybe I'm wrong. You tell me, Kevin. And Steve looks to you as well, Kevin. You're not wrong. Trust me, Steve, it's, it's going to be great. He looks at Colin. Carl, I love you, but... I know you work for the Patriots, you also work for me. So, I trust these guys. It's cool, it's cool. I'm not going to drink, I'm not going to put myself at risk. If they want to talk about local charity, it, it's not going to affect anything business-wise. Colin stares daggers at him. Are you sure, sir? Yeah, I, I know what I'm doing. Listen, this this guy used to be my coach. And this this guy, Mr. Kennedy, he's the person that invited me here in the first place. You know, I know this might seem small town to you, Colin, but Doug Kennedy is one of the most upstanding, honest-to-goodness American patriots you are ever going to meet. I mean, he is dyed-in-the-wool American heartland. Uh... You are not going to find a a more trustworthy guy than Doug. It's funny because a little something in my heart moves at that. Part of me knew he was innocent, but part of me also used to think Steve was just another showboater, just another egotistical guy out there not doing anything for the world. And yet, maybe, maybe I was completely wrong. Maybe he really is the best of us. And I just sort of start... A little tear forms in my eye, and I say, "Oh, Steve, you no, you 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 do me too much credit compared to you. <laughs> I feel like I barely done anything at all." Oh, come on, let, let's 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 move it, okay? All right, but I'm coming with you. Of course, Colin. Of course. They both get out of the car. What's the plan of action now, team? Margot, you hear the sounds of car doors closing. Thump, thump. Looking out the window, you can see the intended trio and another guy. A guy built well over six foot, broad as a football player. He's got to be a bodyguard, personal security, no doubt about it. God, that's not what we need right now. That's not what I need right now. You have your hunting rifle. You're already on edge. Can I ask you to make a coolness roll, please, Margot? Absolutely. I'm giving you a penalty here. I'm giving you a penalty of four to your coolness. My original sum would be a 14. Modified will be a 10. In that case, the hunting rifle is in your hands. You are not compelled at this point to just point it out the window and fire it, though you are damn close. If anyone does as much as spooks, you are going to be gunning for them. I think I start moving up to the cabin itself. I give Kevin a look, ready to open the door, but I do then just pause, just for a second. I take out my phone. I send one last text to my daughter, to Sally. I just say, I love you, sweetie. And I send it, and then I put the phone back in my pocket, and I open the door, gesturing to everyone else. Well, come on in. Again, uh, I just gotta go do something quick, but then I'll be with you guys, and uh, yeah, this should be... This should be swell, Steve. Again, I'm... I'm really hoping that together we're going to do something great. Colin heads in first. May I fire immediately, as soon as he comes in my line of sight? Absolutely, because his mouth does open as if to say, what the fuck, because it looks like a scene from Dexter. There is sheeting laid all over every surface. There are pairing and flensing tools. Uh, it does look like they have been led to into a trap where at least one of them is going to get murdered, wouldn't you know? So can I ask for a violence roll? With a one in violence, 18 modified. Yeah, you've not lost your hunting touch, Margot. That bullet gets drilled right between the eyes of Colin before he can even reach for his gun. Blam! It's like an explosion goes off in the cabin. Steve looks like a deer in the headlights. He doesn't know what's going on. His mouth drops open. He looks to Kevin. And I feign surprise. What? Colin! Instead of running, he run. He ducks down to his bodyguard. 
we, we, we've we've got to we've got to so got to save Colin, and he starts trying to drag him out of the cabin. Uh, Margot, you could step forward and shoot again. I have to. My kids are at. Oh God, fuck! I don't know where my kids are. This needs to be. This needs to be remedied as quickly as possible. I march forward. I eject the shell and I fire again. Violence. It's a ten. I don't know if Isaac got out of that house. I don't know if he got his sister out of that house. Blam! Another bullet. This one tears into his shoulder. He lets out a scream. When Steve screams, he sounds like a young man. Sounds like a teenager who's just been injured on the field. Wrenched an arm, maybe, or torn his groin. One of those injuries that comes up all too often in American football. But in this case, it's a bullet shredding muscle and cartilage between his shoulder and his chest. Oh, God! Coach! I can't hesitate this time. I can't just let Margot do everything this time. I can't, even though I wish I could. I run in. I try and grab the nearest blunt object I can. A fire poker, a phone, a knife, maybe just an ornament, and I, whatever it is, I need to use it to club him over the head. Yeah, you avoid all of the sharp instruments to go for a blunt one. And grabbing the small safety fire extinguisher from beside the door, you bring it down on Steve's head. A violence roll from you, please, Doug. That's a four. Ah! He tackles you as only an NFL player can. Shoulders and head and crack. Doug... Your failure, being as sharp as it was, results in not only the wind being driven out of your lungs, but your body breaking as he slams you with force as if you were a training dummy against the wooden table which is currently lined with sharp metal instruments. You don't know if your back is broken, if it's just your ribs, but right now you cannot breathe. The air has evacuated from your body. Kevin... What are you doing while all this hell is breaking loose? I can't believe I'm doing this, but I'll, I have to. I have to save my friends. He's gonna kill Doug. I can't allow that to happen. Is there something close by that I can use as a weapon? You could lean over him. He's not going for you. He d- still, even with all of this going on, he doesn't think you're in on it. You could grab one of the weapons and he'd probably think that you are uh, on his side trying to defend him. So yeah, you could grab one of the large degloving knives. Yeah, I'll do that. And and I'll move up by his side and and, and as if we were fighting together and then slightly behind him and I'll try to make it as painless as I can. Make a violence roll, please, Kevin. That's a 14. It's a little like trying to tackle a large wild beast that you've shot in the abdomen and it hasn't gone down and you're trying to find a good place to deliver the kill shot but it's making far too much noise it's moving around far too much it's got so much energy so much desperation to survive Eli Jenkins wasn't dissimilar except where he had the disadvantage of grand old age and a corpulent body Steve Sanderson has muscle, has sinew, has youth on his side, a real lust for life, a hankering to survive. And so when you bring that knife to his neck, at first he struggles. He really struggles. He leans backwards and, like a wrestler, he topples with you behind him. Now you're the one who has had the air driven out of him, Kevin, but you were a footballer too. You are still an athlete, even though you're not the athlete you were. You can hold on despite the pain, because this is what you have to do to win the game. The blade on a 14 doesn't make a nice, neat incision in his jugular. This isn't a quick death. You have to saw your way through that muscular neck to find a part that will bleed sufficiently to end his life. There's a moment about six seconds into this soaring motion 
It's before you've delivered the fatal blow. But it's clearly a moment that Steve, in his confusion, just stops fighting. Maybe it's the point at which he realises that this is a betrayal of everything. Maybe it's a resignation that even if he is able to get away from you, he's not going to be able to get away from the other two. But somehow he makes it easy for you. And he stops struggling. He stops fighting. His arms go limp by his sides. Margot, you can see from your vantage point, he closes his eyes. And Kevin... You're finally able to find those vital veins and arteries, and then the blood starts to flow. And I drop the knife, and I I start puking my guts out. I stumble forward, trying to catch back my breath. My back is killing me. I say something. I wanted to say something nice to him, but it doesn't come out that way. Instead, it just comes out... Hero, you <coughs> you hero, Steve. He <coughs> hero, you'll be a hero. <coughs> oh, shit. Marco, help. <laughs> I have tears running down my face. I'm shaking. The rifle is shaking um, in my hand. Is Colin still alive? Oh, no. You took him out with one hit. Okay. Um, I'm going to allow that rifle to... Clatter to the floor. I'm going to immediately run to Doug and pour every ounce of support and affection I can into getting him standing, if that's possible, and getting a blade into his hands. Baby, I have to go. I'm so sorry. Josh tried to kill himself and my kids are at home alone. I have to go. I can't be here. I'm sorry. I have to go. I try and voice some dissent, but I can't catch my breath back, so it just comes out as... I need you. <laughs> I'm going to wrap his fingers around the hand of that blade, look him directly in the face, and I'm going to say you were always the strongest. You were always, always, always the strongest of us. You have to finish this. You have to finish this or this is all for nothing. But right now I have to go. I have to go. She could take out my entire family. I have to go. I nod, feeling suddenly very cold cool, even though I'm in a lot of pain, but it's strange, Margo's, Margo thinks I was strong, even though I've failed so much today. Maybe she's right, maybe I, maybe I can do this, and I'll stumble over, I'll look at Kevin, I'll lean down, and I have no idea what I'm doing. It's probably going to be a very messy job, but I start trying to skin a man the best of my ability. As you're doing it, Margot, long gone now. Kevin, you're recovering from the shock, the nausea. Smoke fills a corner of the room, but without any ceremony, Nikolai steps out of it. Or at least the figure that has been assumed to be Nikolai, the shape. Hmm. <sighs> actually looks down at the body that you're hacking to ribbons in in what could barely be described as a skinning. Now how am I supposed to wear that? I... Why don't you help me then? I don't know. I'm doing what you've said. Well... I can't help you. What about, what about him? Maybe his skin. Maybe, maybe, maybe if you combine the skin, you can wear that then. I say, sounding completely insane. Not interested in the life of a bodyguard. Star football player. Now that's fun. Just be careful with the face. Oh, okay. Okay, and I look to Kevin and say, help me, help me, we need to, we should, you hurt him, we need to make sure the face is, pretty face, nice pretty face. No, 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 no. Well, I don't want to fuck it up so you get a bad face, you fucker! 
composure. Doggy, keep it together. Mr. Miller, you don't have to help him now. This is his crucible. Let Doggy do the skin job. Yeah. You can go home. I freed you, like I said. Doug, I... I gotta go. I, I gotta go back to my family. You, you got this, <laughs> you... Yeah. You got this, I, I say, and I just turn around and I start walking. Nikolai sits next to you, Doug, as you try your best to separate skin from muscle. I do try and at least slow down. That's all I can do. Do it slowly then. Nice and horribly slowly. That's it. If you can't do it in one, do it in nice long strips. Sure thing, Nikolai. Take your time. You must be feeling pretty happy. You've won. You've destroyed all three of us. And now we're all going to hell, just like you. Must be a good day. Good day for me. Me? Happy? I don't know what happiness is, Doggy. I am not a creature of happiness. Of contentment. No? Oh dear. Does it make you happy when you kill kids? Did it make you happy when you tried to kill my daughter? I keep saying this, just gently, slowly, cutting skin, as if this is the most casual conversation in the world. Yeah, he crosses his legs, leans against the table. You're going to want that back looked at by the looks of it. You're going to be struggling to walk out of here. Don't know how you're going to set the big fire that's your plan, but don't worry, I'll take care of you. It's all in the back, or the kerosene. It's funny, because everyone's going to know that he came in here to kill you, or the killer. And and, and, and then the girl will get found, and, and it's all going to be a no, good story no, for no, Steve. No, 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 doggy. Kevin's just driven off with the kerosene. He taps the side of his head. Short-sighted. Oh. Is that the final straw, then, that no fire, so the police will find me here and it's all over for Doug? <laughs> <laughs> Smoke billows from his mouth. No, we don't need fire. We've had enough of that, I think. Don't you? But what will happen when they find Steve's body? Like this. I rather suspect your community will do what it's so good at. It will tell itself to keep a secret. For the good of the community of Noahville. Your little town is good at keeping secrets. Don't you think? I don't really know what to believe anymore, Nikolai. But sure, I, you, you've won whatever happens. I, I've done it now, and and I attempt to finish the job. And when it's maybe finished, I just stand awkwardly with my back in pain and say, "There you go, Nikolai. Everything you wanted, you, you've got." He looks over with some degree of of respect <clears throat> well you haven't done the worst job in the world I've seen better turns out I'm not very good at killing people no you're not not really not with that big gang but the state of this thing makes it look like I'll be picking up in goodwill <laughs> Oh, dearie me. Well, you did your part, more or less. Shame I can't say you're the one that killed him, though. I tried. Yeah, you failed. 
Still a deal's a deal. You did half a job, I'll do half a job. You, my son, are free. Go with God. He kisses his fingertips, plants them on your forehead. <laughs> I bless you. I stumble back. I wait a few seconds. Part of me expecting this to be it now, the doors of hell to open, or the, or the police to suddenly rush in, or I get a phone call that my wife has murdered my children, and I just wait for a few seconds. Go on. Fuck off. You left my car where you meant to, didn't you? We did. What? You don't even... You're going to sort all this crime scene out. What about that little... We need to... The little girl needs to be found. She she was only... We only delayed it because of fucking Steve Sanderson. Hmm. Yeah. Well, her death isn't on my hands. What do you mean? What? Yes, it is. You, you, you're the one who did it. You stalked her and my little girl. No, 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 no. Well, then who did? I don't exist in this world in that way. Well, at least I didn't until now. Till the sacrifice you performed. I'm not your friend Nikolai, Dougie. And no matter how much you tell yourself that, and he reaches out to you and pokes you in the chest, I am not. I am something far older far more complex than some immigrant accused of molesting a bunch of kids and burnt to death. But you know something, he makes a very good mask. I start stumbling back a little, getting ready to leave, and I just say, but then, I... Who... Who was the person in the... Who was the figure? Who... Who tried to... Who killed her? Who? If it wasn't you? Oh, I don't know. I don't keep track of every single outrage that takes place. It would be too distracting. None of my business, quite frankly. But I'm sure you can work it out. You're a bright boy. And then I turn and I just start walking back to the car. Unfortunately, the car is not there. Kevin's long gone. Huh. You've got a long walk on a badly injured spine to get back to your house. But nevertheless, the long walk is what you are set for now. And the entire way, ready any moment for hell. Because surely, surely, they weren't right. Surely we don't win. Surely something any moment now is going to destroy everything. But I guess all I can do is walk home and face it, whatever it is. I'm sorry, Steve. We'll go to Kevin first. Kevin, you get yourself home. Pretty much speeding into the driveway by this point. There's six still down the front of your clothes. And of course, blood all up your arms. But you are free. He made that clear. You are free now. You don't have to be involved in this anymore. Yeah. I, I am free. I promised my wife. We were going to leave this place. And now we can. And my kids are going to be alright. And Walker is not going to be plagued by some specter that visits him in the night. We're going to be able to have a normal life. A normal life in, in Florida. Yeah, I just need to get cleaned up, and then we'll uh, we'll get right on preparing for that, preparing for the big move, selling the house. Yeah, starting a new life. As you enter the house, you can hear the TV is on. Your wife must be in the living room. Do you get changed before you go see her? Yeah, I'll need to clean up. I I can't see her like this. Well, you do get washed up. There is a peaceful silence throughout that second floor of the house. Just the sound of running water washing your sins away, 
all the sick, all the blood, everything going down the drain, washing it away like all the sins of Novaville and all the sins on your hands. And so by the time you get out and you towel off your hair and you put your pyjamas on and head downstairs, it's very late, very late indeed. But the TV is still on. Looks like uh, the wife is watching Unsolved Mysteries. She pauses it. As she turns, she has a glass of wine in her hand. She smiles. Laura smiles at you, and it seems to be a genuine one. That, that's nice. Y you mind if I join you, honey? Please, do. <laughs> I've been think. I, it's, I've had a busy day. Um, it's been a long day. Yeah. And so I hope you don't mind. I'm having some wine. Oh, you, you've deserved it. You've deserved it. Hey, I just... I sit down and I... I sort of lean in close to her and I say... Honey, I, I've been thinking about what you said about... About Florida and... I think you're... You're totally right. <laughs> I think we should go. Oh. Just... We should just go. We should. We should do it. She downs her wine, puts the glass down, and throws her arms around you. Oh, honey, I, I, you have no idea how glad I am you've said that, because I was thinking there's no way we can afford it, and I, uh, I think we can. I think we can make it now. I, 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 I truly believe that Florida is, is where we need to go. Uh, to make a new life, a new start for the both of us. Yeah. For the both of us. For for us and, and for the kids. A dark look crosses her face. The, uh, kids... I don't think we're going to be able to afford a house with the kids. I mean, um... I don't think, um... <laughs> So the kids, I, I I mentioned to them about going to Florida and uh, Walker, he, he didn't really, neither of them were, were taken with the idea. And then I thought, this world, honey, I, and she folds her arms, the, the, the world that we're living in right now is so full of, of danger, of of predators at school, of school shootings, of, of, you know, how, how the, the gays and, and the, and the transgenders, that they all have a, have their plans and they're, they're like deviants and they, they are getting into the heads of the young. And I, I, and I think it's the wrong time to be raising kids in America. I think we need to, I think we need to make this country better before we can... I think it would be irresponsible, Kevin, to raise our kids in this environment. Uh, and I think we, we're still young, and we can start again in Florida, and when things are better, and I think Florida's the place to do it, it's like on the... on the I, I sort of described as this on... Um, on... Uh, what, what's that show? Why, why, why am I not remembering the show? Um... Uh, well, it was described as the vanguard of New America. Yeah, they, they they say those things. Hey, I'm just gonna go check on the kids. Uh, oh no, don't don't do don't do that. Yeah, I just I'll they're, be right. They're so peaceful right now. I'll be right back. And I, having heard what she said, I I, I can't believe what she just said. I have to make sure that they're all right. I'll be moving towards their rooms. But you know. You know, before you even get there, that they're not all right. They're not going to be all right. The, the glass she showed you earlier, you had this much time to get back, to not go out, to not murder that kid. That she was mouthing to you. And there was no reason for you to know that what she was mouthing to you was, I'm just going to give the kids their medicine. There was just no reason, even if you understood it, for you to pick up that there was a threat in that, except they, they don't take medicine, there's nothing they take. In fact, uh, 
Laura is pretty opposed to most medicines and vaccines. But, of course, your mind wasn't there at that time. You freed yourself. That is what the demon promised you. You are free. You are free to start again. That's exactly what you've got. Because it's not you who did this. It's Laura. And she seems perfectly comfortable with the idea that she's done it. Do you still want to enter the bedroom? Yeah, I have to make sure that they're all right. Even if they aren't, I I have to see it. I, I have to see them for myself. I it can't be true. Well, Doug. You get home. It takes all night. It's much later than when Kevin gets back to his house. You'll be staggering around, incredible pain, but your legs, you, your feet, they just keep dragging you forward. One step at a time. You even pass neighbours sometimes, and they pretty much blank you or just give you a summary hello, and that's all there is to it. No one asks after you. No one asks why you're covered in blood, why you're clutching your back. No, but... It doesn't matter, does it? I'm almost home. I laugh a little. I wonder what they'll say when the parade starts. Oh no, Steve! Like, we did, we, we haven't even done anything to cover our tracks. No, it's all just a house of cards, and uh, I'm gonna pull a card out and it's all gonna fall down. But before I get to the door, I do just do one last prayer. I just say, God, please, not. If I failed you. Okay, I ask for forgiveness, but if that's not on the cards, please just spare my children. Just spare them, and, and I'll take whatever else you bring me, God. I swear, if I only ever wanted to do it, do things for you. The devil, <laughs> the devil got me. And I finish my prayer, I look at my house, and I, I walk with terror to the door. The front door opens uh, before you even get to it, and Sally comes running out and hugs you so tightly it hurts your back immeasurably. Daddy! (sighs) I breathe a small, just a small sigh of relief that at least at this moment right now, Sally is okay. Sally! Hi, sweetie! Are you... are you okay? What's wrong? I'm sorry I was so late. I Daddy ran into some awful, it's awful okay. trouble. It's okay. Yeah. I just I couldn't get to sleep and uh, and I I wanted to I wanted a way for you to come home. Oh, is uh is uh is your little brother okay? Where's uh? Yeah, Char Char Charlie's he's asleep. Where is mummy? She's on the sofa. Okay. And you're all good? Was Mummy happy to see you? Mummy was very weird. Oh. I see. How... How so, sweetie? She leads you into the house. And... As painful as it is, she gestures for you to come down to her level. Almost as if she is the grown-up in this situation. In many ways she is. I lean down, I wince. Yes, sweetie? Mummy tried making us a meal. Uh, it was horrid. And the and the food, it, it tasted disgusting. And she kept she kept making all these she said all these words and made all, did all these things that were disgusting as well. And I don't... And Mummy didn't seem like Mummy. Oh, I see. Okay, sweetie, you go upstairs. Uh, go into your little brother's room and you just stay there. I'm... Okay. I'm going to try and talk to Mummy. She runs off. <laughs> okay. Well, here we go. What's he done to my wife? What has he done to her? What can be done now? Is a divorce enough? <laughs> but you know what? 
maybe I've got what's coming coming to me. I'm gonna go in there and I'm just gonna try and settle this and just do whatever she wants. And maybe my mind goes back to that silly idea I had of calling calling people in special services, but let's see. You see that she's sat there on the sofa, unlike uh, Kevin's wife, the television isn't on. She just sat there, upright on the sofa. I go. I sit on the sofa. I wince. It hurts so much, my back. There's probably a little bit of blood now on the sofa, too. I'll have to clean that up later. Oh, there is. But it was there before you got there. I pause and sit upright again. And I look... Deborah? She looks incredibly pale. There's a line around her neck. You would assume from this angle that it makes a perfect circle. There is a small trace of blood around that edge. Top and bottom. I... I'm not quite sure how to handle this. But then again, I've done so many horrible things today... So I don't move. I just start analysing. Does it look like she's killed herself? It would be difficult for her to kill herself like this. That would require her drawing a blade all the way around her neck. Which, while not impossible, seems unlikely, even in your currently panicked and stressed state. I look around the room. Is there... Anything else in the room amiss? I swear I came in, it looked like she was just sitting down. There's a... Yeah, there's cleaning uh, liquids, a bucket, you know, cloths, things like that. That is just in the corner of the room. They don't live here. They live in the kitchen or in the utility cupboard. I go to the kitchen. As you sit up, her head rolls off. I feel I should really react to this stronger, but I don't, because it doesn't matter. She's dead. She is dead. I didn't want her to die. I didn't want that, but I need to think about what happens next, because I need to protect my children now, and this scene makes no sense. Someone came in and did this. I, I start looking around. I make sure to not touch anything. You can see there are small doweling joints and matchsticks protruding from her neck to where it would have been attached to her head. You can... you hear the thunder of footsteps running down the stairs again, and Sally stands in the doorway. Oh, it fell off again, then. What do you... what do you mean, sweetie? I... at school... In art, they told us that when making sculptures, you could use little pegs to make things not fall off. And I used those those little wooden things and matches, and everything I used, the head just kept coming off. Like I said, Mommy was acting weird. And in the end, I just had to shut her up. I see. You know why that wasn't a very good thing to do, don't you, honey? I think she would have hurt Charlie. So I think I did a good thing, and she pouts. <laughs> Sometimes we do things for good reasons, but it's not always that simple. But I think I understand. Sure. Okay, honey. Now I need to... Okay. I need to call the police now. We need to let them know someone came in and... You're acting weird as well now, Daddy. Oh, I know. Why don't you sit down and I'll make you a cup of coffee? No, honey. You need to listen to me. We need to tell the Why police... Why don't you sit down and I will make you a cup of coffee? I raise my voice. We need to sit down and tell them a very nasty man don't is coming. Don't shout at me, Daddy! Or I'll shut your mouth, too. Oh, will you now, little girl? Go to your room. I start marching to the phone, and I'm... I'm aware of what's going on here, but no. 
No, I'm going to call the police. I'm telling them the nasty man came in and murdered Mummy, and then you and me and little Charlie were all going to go away from this when they all look for the nasty man who did this to your Mummy. You understand, little girl? Shh. She blows a raspberry at you and heads upstairs. And I'll go. Granted, maybe this is all for nothing and they'll suspect me and I'll get arrested, but then it does occur to me I have the perfect alibi. <laughs> Everyone in town has just seen me walking home. So I couldn't have done it, but... I mean, you were covered in blood. That's true. But it doesn't matter anymore anyway, because as long as... She doesn't go away for this, it's fine. So, I have connections, and Doug will do his best to phone the police on the man who has come into his house. Maybe it's even the same man who attacked that girl the other week. Still at large. Maybe it doesn't really matter. My little girl can't go away for this. I need to protect her. I'll do my best. You pick up the phone. Now, Margot, to conclude, you rushed back as soon as you could. You didn't have a vehicle, so there was frantic running through the woods. Somehow you got yourself turned around. You ended up almost exactly, you think, where that poor young girl, Fiona, was given a shallow grave. You didn't have time to stick around and make sure. You just kept running in the direction of home. By the time you get there, the volunteer fire brigade are already at your house. It's not on fire, thank goodness, but there's a lot of smoke. It smells of the smoke that emerged from Nikolai's house when the house was burning and the body of Nikolai was as well, but you know on some level that's just your psyche telling you that. There is no fire. Nothing is burning. This is rancid fuel smoke. This is a car that's been chugging away in a sealed garage. That's what this is. Your children, when they see you, they run up to you. And they both cling on to you for dear life. Your neighbour gives a wave and heads back into their house completely it seems oblivious to the fact that yours is the site of a suicide Isabel and Isaac have clearly been crying for a long time their faces are swollen and blotchy but it doesn't matter they're alive mummy Mummy, is Daddy okay? An ambulance is on its way. You can see it down the street. But the lights aren't flashing. It's too late for that. I have tears running down my face. I am so incredibly relieved that they're alive. I didn't know whether I was going to be able to have that. But they're alive and they're here. And I... I look at them and says, I don't know. Mommy doesn't know. But no matter what, we're together and we're going to be okay. Okay? I'm so sorry I left you. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I didn't know he was going to do Please that. Please don't leave us again. I won't. I promise you. I swear. I swear. I swear. We'll always be together. Okay? Okay. Okay. Every now and then I, they ask you again, is daddy okay? Is daddy going to be okay? It's clear very quickly that he isn't. What is extracted from your garage is not a body of flesh and bone. It is a bag, a blue bag, human size. On a trolley, but you know what it means. At their age, they don't. Maybe at some point in their future, when they grow up, they will remember that they saw Daddy come out of the garage in a long blue sack. But right now, all they know is just a bag, like a long sports bag that's just been extracted from Daddy's garage. 
And they really only have eyes for you at this point. I feel so much shame in this moment. And I can't shake the feeling of feeling betrayed or duped or doped. There are a thousand fucking different ways that Josh could have died. And this thing chose the one way that would terrify my children simultaneously. Stacy Wishford is jogging down the street. She stops by you and your kids. Oh, hey, Margot. Oh, wow, have you had a fire? Are you okay? Do you want to come over my... And she looks to your kids. Do you want to come over mine? I've got milkshakes. Come on, let's come over... Come over my place, Margot. I know you don't like me, but... And she smiles, and you can see it's a forced smile, but not because she hates you. It's a smile for the benefit of your kids. Come over mine. Let's have a drink of something. You can... The kids can have a bath because they're they're a bit smoky. Let's get you off the street. Okay? Margot? I stand, disentangling myself from my children. I'm going to hold on to either of their wrists. I look at Stacy in a brand new light for the very first time since this whore moved into our neighborhood, our community. And I eye her from toe to head to head to toe again. And I nod and I smile. Thank you, Stacy. Um, a bath, milkshakes, a drink. We'd all really appreciate that. You got it. I do a tally in my head of how many people that I've killed in the last 24 hours, and I wonder if I could slide one more in without notice. Later that day, the parade goes on as planned. None of you attend. In fact, the vast majority of people from Novaville don't. The events of the last few days, the last week, have in some way done a psychological number on so many people here, everyone who has witnessed something, everyone who's been a part of something, whether it has been the parents whose child was pushed over by yours, or whether it is the mother of Fiona, whether it is the neighbour who saw you coming out of Eli Jenkins' house. Whether it's the guy who seemed to be masturbating while your house was seemingly on fire. Whether it's basically anyone. Anyone who has come into contact with this sordid tale switches off from everything. They switch off from the community. They switch off from each other. And they certainly switch off from you. They don't care about you anymore. They don't care about Novaville. They barely care about themselves. The sense of community is gone. Novaville is free. It's free from the community you set up, the community you inherited, the, the lies, the secrecy, everything that was put in place. All of that is now gone. And at the head of the parade, Steve Sanderson, in an ill fitting skin suit, sits on a float. The few people that come out to watch can't really tell from their vantage point that this isn't the Steve Sanderson they've seen on TV. They can't tell at all. They can't see the incision on his neck where a saw blade was driven through it. They certainly can't see the strips of skin that are now coating his arms. They can't smell the rancid kerosene fumes that emerge from every orifice on his body. And they don't hear his voice, which he will take some time to master. And so once the parade is done, Steve Sanderson 
waves to the last few people who give a shit, and he gets into his car outside the Jefferson's house, which miraculously starts. He swings by Kevin's house, where Kevin is having to deal with whatever it is Kevin discovered. He pops the trunk, doesn't go in, just scoops up the photo album, puts it in his car, and drives off to his uncertain future, leaving you to all of yours. You have listened to an episode of Red Moon Roleplaying, where we play the scenario Tapestry of Suburbia, from the scenario collection The Forbidden, for Cult Divinity Lost. Cult Divinity Lost is published by Helmgast, who have also sponsored this series. Joining us as players in this series are none other than Bridget Jeffries from Symphony Entertainment and our dear friend Matthew Dawkins. The music was made by Atrium Carceri, featuring a number of collaborations with other artists, and was used with permission from their label, Cryochamber. Check out their website at cryochamber.bandcamp.com or their YouTube channel for some moody dark ambient for your gaming table. We'd like to give massive thanks to our champions of the Red Moon, Martin Hoyshobert, Simon Cooper, David, Julia, Camilla, Bob Lange, Cameron, Anton, and Graham Berry for their generous support. And we'd of course also like to thank all of our other patrons. Without your support, the show would not be possible. If you want to support our work, please check us out on Patreon. You can get access to bonus campaigns for Cult of Unity Lost and Coriolis there, as well as get early and raw access to all of our recordings. You can also hear your name read on the show as a champion of the Red Moon, as well as play Cult with us. Most importantly, that support is what keeps the show going, so do check us out there. Thank you again for listening, and remember that community is everything.